Awesome, awesome. Alrighty, I think I may. Oh, there it is. I knew I was holding my Bible for a minute there. One of the things that I would like for us to do very quickly is I would like for us to pray. Every single one of us, if you could just take a posture of prayer wherever you're at. If that looks like um, having your eyes shut and your heads bowed, and just for a moment, I want you to just place a demand on the grace of God that is here present with us in this atmosphere. Just uh, be reminded that wherever two or three are gathered in his name, he is very much there in the midst of them. He said it, we believe it, we experience it. It is our portion, it is our privilege. And with every privilege comes responsibility. If we have been given the privilege of promise, we need to demonstrate the responsibility of faith. And our faith is being made known by our actions. So if you truly believe that we have come here in his name and that he is here in the midst of us, why don't you say something right now? Let it be a functional moment. Let it not just be a ceremonial moment, but one wherein you are tapping in and you are pressing in and you are drawing and receiving as you should of that which is available to you in his name and in his presence. In his name, because wherever the Lord places his name, that becomes Bethel. That becomes the house of God. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you because you hear me always. Thank him because he is a God that hears. And thank him also because he speaks expressly for your sake and for my sake that we may know what the heart of the Father is for his beloved ones. He has given us his Holy Spirit. Father, we worship you. We thank you because of ourselves. We can do nothing. Praise the Lord. God is good. Amen, amen. Let's be seated. Alrighty, God is good. How many people thought that session of singing and praising God was phenomenal? I think it was excellent. Praise the Lord. Highly, highly anointed. You know, when you see people who actually sing and worship God in their closet, when they come out, you can tell. Because deep calls on to deep. You understand what I mean? And you know, there is a difference between being able to harmoniously put your technicalities together to create vibrations that trigger emotional responses. There's a difference between all of that rigmarole and actually having people that just know that God is good and they want somebody else to echo the same with them. And I believe that was what we experienced in that time of worship. Folks that are not just singing from the belly, but folks that are declaring from the heart the goodness and the greatness of God. It is a privilege to be here and to experience that. I want you to perform a little exercise. Ask yourself, how did I get here? Ask yourself. You know, because quite often we, are, we become so familiar with the leading of the Lord that we no longer pay attention to the goodness of his intentions. You see, because we know that we are led by the Spirit, but it is important for us to pay attention and to ask ourselves, ourselves these questions every now and again. Of all the places where you can be right now in the world and of all the activities you could be engaging in, why now, why here, why this moment? Hallelujah. Because you could have been anywhere. You could be at home watching television. Someone is. You could be sitting in the parking lot somewhere thinking of what next evil you're going to perpetrate. Someone is and you are capable of it too. So why not that? Why this? You know, we shouldn't take for granted the fact that the Lord himself said, as David had a revelation that the Lord has written concerning me all of the days of my life in his book. He wrote it in his book. We do not have such understanding here at Communion House that because the Lord says he has written all that concerns me in his book, I don't have to be careful because at the end of the day, he's already written it, so I don't even have any say in what is going on. That is the understanding of the people who do not have understanding. 
Because for us, we know by scripture that the way God pencils the events of your life and mine is by having a foreknowledge, not by having a strong arm. So he doesn't twist your arm to do things, but he lovingly observes your choices and he pencils down what you choose to do so that he can also record that which he does to ensure that where your shortcomings abound, his grace abounds even much more. It is important to understand the technicalities of this pen of the Almighty God that he has so carefully brought out to craft the verses of your existence. Jesus himself said, Behold, I go as it has been written of me in the volume of the books. And what was written concerning him in the volume of the books? It was written concerning him because the Heavenly Father, his Heavenly Father in mind, observed that the burden that he had to carry as part of his calling would feel too weighty and too heavy and he will for a second consider throwing in the towel. And the father observed with so much agony in his heart that his son would want to give up because Jesus came to that point wherein he said, Father, if you will, if by some chance, let this cup pass over me. But I am thankful to God that the Lord Almighty did not run out of ink, neither did heaven run out of paper, because he continued to write after that. And he wrote also very beautifully into the verse of the Messiah that he got to that point wherein he said, not my will, but yours be done. And the heavenly father said to the host of heaven at that particular point in time, I told you. You see, because the heavenly father knows he already knows. The Bible says in the book of Romans chapter 8 that whom he did for no, he predestined. The Bible did not say he just came out randomly predestining people because that would not be in alignment with what we are. What are we? We are an expression of God's individuality equipped with the power to choose so that whenever we recognize what the truth is, we can choose to love him as dear children, not as robots that just carry out instructions. That is what we are. We are beings made in his image and likeness, given the power of choice so that your love for him can be genuine. There are things that we do on the daily basis that we do not love to do. That is the reason why most of us, we don't just go to work. Most of us go to jobs. And like I've told you, the word job means that which you hate. Because job means hated. And so many of us go to jobs because we do not, we feel like we do not have a choice. We feel compelled to do it because necessity has been laid upon us in more ways than one. And God observes such things that take place on, under the sun and he calls it servitude. God says this is slavery. This is, this is servitude. No one is meant to do things because they are compelled to. People are meant to do things because they choose to. No matter how good that thing is, you are not meant to do it by compulsion. You're also always meant to do it by choice. Because choice is what gives the opening. Choice is what opens the door to love. Let me say that again in the King James English. Revelation chapter 3 verse 20. Jesus says, behold... I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears my voice and opens the door, how many people have ever thought about the fact that Jesus is not just knocking, hoping that you will hear the knocking, he is also pleading to come in. Because he did not say if anyone hears my knocking, he says if they hear my voice. You see, because he wants to make sure that you do not just think that it is the wind that is rattling your door. He does not want you to think for a second that it is the neighbor's dog that is trying to get in. He doesn't want you to think that it is the construction project going on on the next street that is making your door vibrate. He is knocking and speaking at the same time, saying it is me. It is I, I want to come in. But he says, if any man hears and then chooses to open the door. So love cannot come in unless you choose. 
So that is what we are. We are beings who have been equipped with the ability to choose. And that is the reason why God did not just wake up one day and said, I'm going to predestine Laura to be this and that. He says, no, I foreknow you first. Whom he did foreknow. To foreknow means to allow oneself to be in the position of knowing ahead of being. You see, we think about that and we just think about it in terms of the omnipotence of God. But I have come to learn to think about it in terms of the loving heart of God. God doesn't just try to foreknow us because he can. He foreknows us because he just could not wait to see us become before he beholds us. Today I come to you in the name of Jesus with one hope in mind that I will be able to remind you of the love of your heavenly father and that I may be able to stir up within you the willingness to Choose that love that has chosen you even before the foundations of the earth. God said in his word, whom I foreknow, I predestined. Why does he even care to foreknow me? He could have just waited until I showed up on the scene. I said, okay, let's see what this one's got. But the Bible says he did foreknow us simply because of the love that he has for us. When you love someone, you can wait to see them. You tell them, oh, send me a picture. <laughs> when you love someone, John was telling me, there's a friend that I haven't seen in 10 years. He's coming to town and I am picking him up from the airport. The guy could have taken an Uber, but John misses his friend and he can't wait. And that is the reason why God, so you have to understand that the reason why God took up his pen in the first place to begin to scribble the verses of your existence is because he wants to write you a love letter before you begin to stumble through life. The Bible says, whom he did for no, he predestined. And why will he predestine you? Simply because he has already foreknown you and he knows that there are times wherein you will not choose life. And that was why he came to the children of Israel before they started to follow after the Canaanite goddess that would do nothing but take the life that God gave to them. God came very quickly because God could see the horde of darkness and how they also want to be a partaker of the precious gift that is called the children of God. And so when God saw the lineup of the Baals, he saw the arraignment of the Canaanites, he saw all of them, including God and money, he saw these gods, how they were going after his elects. So he came in front of the line and he said to them, I said before you today, life and death choose life that you may live why did he say that I set before you today life and death because all those other miscreants as we would like to call them sometimes who are coming after you they are also part of his handiwork but he did not make them so that they can destroy you they have other purposes they are just violating their order and because he is a just God he has judgment waiting for them and that is why he will not cut them short in their assignment unless it is for your sake even though for your sake sometimes he allows them so that you can be strong. You know, because sometimes because of the goodness and the mercy of God, we can be babied through life. And so God every now and again to make sure that you are not a spoiled child that becomes useless to the kingdom. And so every now and again he would allow Satan to sift you as wind so that that which is chaffy about you can be blown away and that which has substance can remain. Because if we're not blown every now and again by this wind of temptation, we will carry so much baggage that does not contribute to the fulfillment of destiny. We will continue in friendship relationships that do nothing but keep the presence of God away from our lives. We will continue to hold on to assets and material things that do nothing but weigh down our hearts. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And so every now and again, the Lord releases Satan from from the bottomless pit so that you can have an opportunity to shake off the unwanted and that which remains can only be that which is of God. But none of these things will become apparent to you if you do not pay attention and ask yourself questions every now and again like the one we did at the beginning. How did I even get here? The person who invited me is not even here. The person who told me the most amazing things about the prophetic gift that is at communion house and the sweet loving fellowship and the heart and the commitment to feed, equip, and disciple himself or herself has been blown away by offense. But I am here. He 
You remember how reluctant you were on the day to stop and ask if that person was okay, but you did nonetheless simply because you felt like, okay, okay, I'm just going to do it. And that person who was not okay that you were checking on was the one that God used to introduce you to a place where he has prepared for you to be fed, to be equipped, and to be discipled. And so you cannot take credit for the goodness of God. You can, none of us can take credit for where we are. But I dare to say to you again, once again, because the Lord says to me to repeat that word, because to somebody it is a reminder of promise, but to another in here today, it is a prophetic declaration that where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. Because the way we understand the foreknowledge of God and the predestination of God is the fact that when God goes ahead in his love and it is in his divine anticipation. Now, if you're wondering, because someone is like, can you give us an example of someone that God was so eager to see that he could not wait to see? Look at the man called Jeremiah. God said to him, before I formed you, I knew you. God took his time to run simulations of what the life of Jeremiah would look like. He ran it again and again, and at every iteration, he was observing the nuances of his natural choices. And that way, God was able to package his own intervention to bring those natural choices to supernatural conclusions. Because Jeremiah, in his own natural choice, he chose to be timid because he saw himself as not having advanced enough in age to influence his community. And so when God came to him, he says, but you know that I am but a youth. And God says, please don't say that again. God told him, don't say that again. Because when he said it the first time, God wrote it down. Now Jeremiah said, I am a youth, but I said, you are a man of valor. And so when Jeremiah was saying it, he was trying to overwrite that which God has written. And God was like, no, I'm not going to let you do that. Because I have foreknown you and predestined you not to fall into that trap. Because the Bible says, whom he did for no, he predestined. And whom he predestined, he called. And the ones he called, he justified. So that at the end of the day, they can be presented for glory without questions asked. Because remember, the people that could have questioned the victory of Jesus, they had already gone to hell, poking their nose to see what had become of the Savior. And they fell for their own traps because the Bible says the ones that dig a pit will fall into it. And the ones who craftily sets a trap will be caught by his own work. And so they were no longer available to make it back to heaven when Jesus showed up at resurrection. And that was why there was nobody to contest when the father said to him, sit at my right hand. Jesus was justified and glorified. And in the same way you and I will be because the father has foreknown you and predestined you. And why did he do all of that? So that when the time comes that your condemnation is coming from even you, he can shut your mouth. I tell people sometimes, if you don't know what's in the mind of God, you don't need to guess. It is better to keep quiet than to say the wrong thing. It is. At least we learned that from the man of God, Gabriel. Most times when I say the man of God, I'm usually referring to David. But the man of God, or the person whose name literally means man of God, is Angel Gabriel. Gabriel means man of God. But I call David the man of God because the Bible says he is a man after my own heart. You know, the Bible also lets us know that the eyes of the Lord run, the eye, sorry, not the eyes. The eye of the Lord runs to and fro upon the earth, seeking for the man whose mind is stayed on him. You see, God is looking for people who are looking for God. And so this is my advice to young ministers, and this is my advice to people who are still trying to get close to God. If you are not feeling close to God, or if you don't believe and you don't see proof that you are getting closer to him, then you need to ask yourself, what exactly am I looking for? Because some people are not looking for God, they're looking for power. Some people are not looking for God, they're looking for plenty. Some people are not looking for God, they're looking for comfort. God is not comfort, he's the comforter. He is not plenty, he's the giver. God is not power, he's the almighty. But if we don't understand 
what we're looking for, we cannot find him because he's only looking for people looking for him as opposed to people looking for things. People looking for things will always find things. The trouble is they may not find the things they like. <laughs> Let me show you something in Jeremiah chapter 17. Verse 23. Jeremiah 17, 23. The Bible says, but they did not obey nor incline their ear, but made their neck stiff that they may not hear nor receive instruction. The Bible says the reason why we're not receiving instruction is because we are not asking questions. Because we are not applying and inclining our ears to hear. And that is the reason why we have not been spoken to. Or it seems like we haven't been spoken to, but God has already spoken because his love speaks continually. The Bible says the spirit of the Lord speaks expressly. And because he upholds everything by the word of his power, his word continues to be in operation because the moment the word of God stops, everything ceases. So God is always speaking. But he says the reason why they are not hearing is because they're not asking questions about the verse. Even though they want to talk about the universe. You see people today and they're like, oh, the universe is not going to let that happen. Okay. <laughs> but I tell you what, the secret to being able to know the Bible says he knows who quests to know is you need to develop the ability to ask questions. Don't just make assumptions. And don't get too complacent because every now and again we always say it is what it is. But it is what it is should be the last thing we say. You know why? Because it is what it is is not a question it is a conclusion. And the Bible says we need to begin with the question. The Bible says by wisdom, a house is built. What is the wisdom? Wisdom is the verse in the heart of God that answers the question why. Understanding is what answers the question how. And knowledge is what answers the question what. And so if we don't begin with asking why, we will never get to the heart of the wisdom of God. And by so doing, we miss, uh, we miss out a lot on the moments that God is building for us. Because everything he's doing, he's setting us up to come into experiences and the fullness of our relationship with him. Everything that God is doing in your life, dear, is God is building a house around you and he wants to come into that house with you in your business, in your family life, in your parenting. He wants to come into that house, but he builds it first for you and then he knocks so that you can let him in. And to build that house, it has to begin by wisdom. And that is the reason why it is important for you to stop and ask, how did I get here? What is the Lord doing with me? And how does he want to use me in this situation. But the Bible says that if we do not ask, you see Jeremiah 17, 23 is an amazing verse of scripture because it also tells us something that becomes of the people who are just one track minded, who are only going with the flow, saying it is what it is. The Bible says that God sees such people as stiff naked people. They're always just like that, like zombies. They're not turning around to observe what the Lord is doing. They're not looking to see the ram that may be caught in a the thicket. They're not looking to see how they can be useful. They're not looking for clues. Even after God says that it is my glory to conceal things, but it is yours to search them out. And so if God has concealed things, then I have no benefit from just keeping my neck stiff. And many of us do it simply because we don't want to be judged. Many of us do it simply because we can't be bothered. 
God wants to reveal so much more to us and he wants us to find the things that he has hidden along the path of obedience. He wants you to see things. You know, because I came before the Lord and I said, Lord, how come this person is missing this? How come that person is missing that? How come we are going through life and there is so much want? Are you no longer a shepherd? Because the Lord, the Bible says, the Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. And then the Lord opened my eyes and then I saw that we mostly have been walking around like stiff naked people, not asking questions and not being curious and inquisitive enough. And the Lord says, I've got treasures everywhere under their seats. Even Oprah tries to let us know that there is always something under your seat. Every one of us, we're always sitting on something precious. Because the Bible says that the way to receive is to have. Many of us think the way to have is to receive. Let me say that again. Because <laughs> it's kind of like messing with Christian theology here. You know, many of us think that, oh, the reason why I don't have this and that is because I have not received. If you have that mentality, what you're also saying is God has not done his job. Because he says, I am your provider. And so if I'm saying I don't have because I have not received, then I am saying that God has not given me. But the word of God says that he has given you, not he will give you. He has given to you all that pertains to life and godliness. The Bible says in Christ, all things consist. Has he given you Christ? I know y'all are really waiting for the second coming, but the reality of it is that he has already given you Jesus. And so that means we have all things. And Jesus put it this way. Jesus says to him who has more shall be given, but the one who has none that which he has will be taken from him. So the way to have is not to receive. The way to receive is to have. You need to have something. And so because God knows that you need to have something to be able to receive more, he gets you started with that basic, fundamental thing that you need. And it is called a measure of faith. The Bible says he has given to each one of us a measure of faith. But you are sitting on your faith, because the only way to activate that measure of faith is to get up, because faith without works is dead. Remember the Jews, when they needed Jesus, they would send somebody, but they would stay at home. But the centurion, he got up, and they came to Jesus. And you know what he told Jesus? He was like, I'm already a man under authority. I say this and it, and it happens. You don't even have to come to me. Just say the word. And Jesus says in all of Israel, I have never seen faith like that of this man because faith that is not in operation is a faith that has been sat on and as far as God is concerned, it is raw material. It is not ready. You have what it takes already. You have the love of God and the benevolence of God that has already given to you everything that pertains to life and godliness. And he has given you the heart of curiosity. He just needs you to begin to ask questions so that by so doing, you are fulfilling all righteousness. God is so eager for you to find what he has hidden. He's more eager for you to find it. I mean, just imagine, think about it. If you are a husband and you want to surprise your wife, and you buy her this perfume or this cologne that she really loves, and you wrap it up nicely, and you hide it in the pantry. If you have a wife that cooks, you may even have it in the kitchen. Hide it in the kitchen. Hoping that one day she would open up the cupboard, I mean, she would open up the pantry drawer or somewhere in the kitchen cabinet and find it. And that would be the joy of it when, when she opens it. I heard this joke somewhere, so don't, don't quote me. When she opens it, she would see it, and the inscription was, would be, I'm glad you found it like I found you. Aren't I sweet? Or maybe I'm just really good at repeating other people's jokes. But the truth of the matter is, it is God's delight to have you find the things that he has hidden so that you can get to know him. 
You see, because you were hidden in the dust of the earth and the earth itself was hidden under the sea. Not just one sea, but two seas. The Bible says the waters above and the waters beneath had collapsed and they had buried all the ground and darkness came and sat upon that, com that concussion. And when God came, he found you in the dirt and he called you his own and the Bible says he rejoiced over you. And there is no way you're going to know him if you do not experience what he has experienced. And that is the reason why he hides the treasures of your life. So that when you find them and you find joy, you can beat, your heart can then beat with the same frequency as God's heart. And then he's going to say, yeah, how does that feel? That's how I felt when I found you. You want to know God? You want to hear God? Ask questions. Stop and take inventory of your life. Do you know that I have found that one of the ways that it has become easy for me to overcome offense is by asking questions of the people that offend me. I ask questions like, why is this person able to hurt me like they do? And then the answer is because they have been so good to me in the past and they have been such a benefit to me in the past that now that they're failing to be what they have been, I am disappointed. I wouldn't be disappointed if they were a nuisance from day one. Does it make sense? Every husband needs to ask themselves that question whenever your wife seems to be annoying. Because the question would be, how come this woman is able to annoy me this early morning? And the answer would be because one day you knelt and you prayed to God to guide you by his hand that you may find her who is bone of your bone and flesh of your flesh. For the Bible says a wife is a good thing and the one who finds her finds favor of the Lord. The reason why she's that close to you and able to wake up next to you to annoy you that early in the morning is because she's an answer to prayers. And then you will begin to address your posture because gratitude is the fixer of every bad attitude. Let me tell you something. Many of us think that we need to be up there before we are in a good mood, but you don't know that you need to be in a good mood to be up there. You understand what I mean? Because sometimes you think that, oh, if only I just had money right now, I'm just going to feel good. But... Have you not seen people who have money who still need drugs to feel good? I mean, just having money should be enough. Having money is, it should be enough. You don't even have to buy anything with it if money is truly as powerful as you think. You understand what I mean? And so you need to have been somebody who can champion your progression through the cadres of existence without needing substance. Because whatever you need to take you up there will be required to keep you up there. And if your sustenance is dependent on objects and forces, then at the end of the day, you become subservient to them because you cannot live without them, but they cannot always be with you because they're not faithful. They are here today and they are gone tomorrow. Even the Bible says of money that it will develop wings and fly away. Have you not seen billionaires whose third generation and fourth generation are now on the street corners begging? Simply because the wealth grew wings and flew away. And so what do, I, what do I mean by you need to recognize the question that you must ask is because those questions unveil what's already there that you may have overlooked. I'm going to show us a verse of scripture real, real quick in Matthew 27. In fact, let's read it and then we'll, let's read Romans chapter 8 first of all. Romans 8 will take our time, so let's just read Romans chapter 9. Romans 9. And if you want to tell the, the, the kids and the youth that we're wrapping up, that would help very greatly because they must be expecting that I'm going to preach till 4 a.m. today, but it's, we're about to finish. So just let them know, give them a heads up. And if possible, any one of them that is ready, they can come in here and join us for communion in the next five minutes. Praise God. Isn't that awesome? God is good. Praise God, my wife did say to me that several moms in particular are still trying to get settled 
you know, because of the school resumption and all whatnot. And so these are not the times to do a revival of revelations. And what she means by revival of revelations is you don't have to keep digging this one up and digging that one up. Just, just keep it short and sweet. Cut it short in righteousness. Romans chapter 9, verse 2. The Bible says, let's, let's read um, verse 12, sorry. It was said to her, the older shall serve the younger. Now, this was a prophecy uh, that came to um, um, Rebecca was told the same thing. I believe Sarah was also told the same thing because you know when Rebecca was pregnant with Isaac, I mean, sorry, not with Isaac, she was married to Isaac. When she was pregnant with Esau and Jacob, it was said that the younger will serve the older. I want you to hold that thought for a moment and come with me to Matthew chapter 27. I want to show you a question here in 27. We're going to read verse 42. The Bible says, he saved others himself. He cannot save. If he is the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. These guys are asking a question. That if he is the true king and he is the Messiah, we want to see him save himself and then we will believe him. I want to unravel a mystery to you folks. Do not ask questions so that you can believe. Ask questions because you believe. Let me tell you the way that it works. Anybody who believes who, anyone who does not believe first before asking questions will not receive. Because to receive, you must have. The people who ask questions before they believe, they question God and question the promises of God and they question the word of God. And the Bible says that whoever must come to him must first of all believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Do you know, let me give, you, let me give you an example of one of the questions that was asked in the Bible uh, in addition to this one by people who did not believe. The disciples of Jesus, when they were on that boat that was about, that to them was about to capsize because of the storm, they said, do you not care that we perish? Do you know the meaning of what they just said? They questioned if Jesus was truly the Savior. Because the Savior will save. You can't be the Savior if you're watching us pee on ourselves out of fear. You cannot possibly be the Savior. And after Jesus rescued the situation, they looked at them and it was like, oh, you of little faith. That's what we read, right? Because the translators of the King James Bible were too afraid to say, oh, you of no faith. The original word in the Hebrew, even in the Greek, says, oh, you of no faith, because even if your faith is as little as a mustard seed, it will move mountain. So if your faith is not working, it is not activated. It is no faith. Don't be kidding yourself and say, well, I've got little faith and I'm working on my faith. No, you're sitting on your faith. Jesus was quoting Moses here. When Moses wrote what God said, God said, these stiff-necked people, they are a wicked and a perverse generation. I have looked into their hearts and I have found no faith. I have nothing to write because I am not going to write unbelief. And so their lives were empty because the Almighty had nothing to write concerning them. You missed what I said. So you have to watch it again. What I just said now is a continuation of what I started with. That he loves you so much. He just can't wait to see what you will become. So he foreknew you. Like he foreknew Jeremiah. 
And they knew that at some point Jeremiah would want to deny God and deny the power of God by believing more in himself than he believes in God. Then looking at his own ability, then look at God's own ability. And God stopped him one time, and that was all they took. Jeremiah did not repeat his unbelief, but the children of Israel continued to repeat their unbelief. And so God, as he was writing the pages of their lives, he kept skipping lines because he was waiting for them to partner with him by faith. But all they had was complaints. And so their lives were empty because they had no faith. I asked the Holy Spirit, I said, why did the Father call them a wicked and a perverse generation? And the Holy Spirit said to me, he said, because whenever God writes a thing, it is a good thing. And so because of their unbelief, he had nothing to write about them. So when there's no goodness, what you're left with is wickedness. And so God was not insulting them. He was just describing the choice that they made. Because sometimes you struggle with God being a good father. I really want to believe you're good. But you just call these people wicked and perverse just because they complained a little here and there. But I tell you they complained a little too much. And that is the reason why we must not be complainers, but we must be believers who then ask questions after having believed. Someone says, but if I've already believed, why am I asking questions? You're asking questions to clarify what you believe. Because you need to have something. You understand what I mean? You need to have something. These people were like, if, if, if he can save himself first, then we will believe him. They said that we may believe him. And that's, why the, that's the reason why they perished in their sins. They perished in their sins and their children did not even have a chance because they were killed by the Romans just a couple of decades later. You see, it is such a devastation for us to live our lives as stiff-necked people who do not learn how to ask questions for unraveling, not questions for believing. I'm going to explain this a little bit more. Um, was there a verse of scripture that I called out that we haven't read? Did we read Romans chapter 9 verse, verse 12 and we read Matthew chapter 27 verse 42, right? Okay, we're going to read two more verses of scripture just to clarify some of the things that I have said. We're going to read... Verse 11, the Bible says, of Matthew chapter 27, Jesus says, the Bible says, Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said to him, It is as you say. So they already had an opportunity to be reminded that Jesus is the king. Because the people who were like, if he, hasn't, if he cannot save himself, we will not believe him, were the ones who brought him to the governor and made sure that they witnessed his, what's it called, his trial. But still, they were asking questions. This is what I put to you, ladies and gentlemen, that the word of God, the scripture that you have received, is exactly what you need to come to the conclusion of the goodness of God. And your question should then be, what has the goodness of God produced that I have not yet fully grasped? Not to question if God is good. Question what you may be missing as opposed to what God may be missing because God is not missing a thing. We're going to break bread from the book of Exodus chapter 40. But before then, I want to read to you this Romans chapter 8. I was going to rush over everything, but I believe we need to read it because some of us need to read it here with us and then you go and read it on your own and meditate upon it because even though it has been quoted to you, you also benefit from knowing exactly where it is and, you, and, and then go to meditate on it even more. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. The Bible says, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, not the ones that God loves, because God loves everybody. And things don't begin to work together for you until you know how to reciprocate that love. Let's explain that for a minute. The Bible says all things work together for good to those who love God and the called according to his purpose. And how do you love him? Peter explains in one of his epistles, he says we love him because he first loves us. 
So when God comes to you, he comes to you in his love. His inquisition into your future and the reason why he knows and foreknows you is because that love drives him to get out from where he was to where you will be. Because you know he's already seen that in eternity. But because of you, he comes through time. And when you're in time, you experience emotions because emotions are essentially the fabric of time. Because time is in motion. So your emotions, that's why they're always fleeting. Your emotions are essentially a function of time because at some time you're happy and at some other time you're not happy. No matter how excited you are about a thing, you know when you bought that car, it was the first brand new car that you ever bought, you were so excited for three days you couldn't sleep, you visited all your friends and started to look for your enemies that you would visit so that they may see this little machine that is in your name. Well, really in the name of the bank because you're still paying for it. Now, you know how excited you are, but then after a while, you look at that car sometimes and you're like, especially after you get a new one, you're like, man, was this car, was this, was, uh, did it always look like this? Because when, in, when the, the Bible says when the latter glory is revealed, the former ceases to be glory. What happened to you? The passage of time restructured your emotions. And so here is the deal. The Bible says God, he came into time and he started to show emotions like a man. Let me give you an example. God wanted to experience life through the eyes of Adam and he saw how much pain he was in. And the Bible says the heart of God was so broken he regretted making man. He was sorry that he made man. How can God be sorry? The Bible says God is not a man that he should lie. Not the son of man that he should repent. As God, he doesn't repent because what does he repent of? The wrong that he did, he can do no wrong. Whatever he does, the Bible says stands forever. Everything that God does becomes the right thing. You understand what I mean? He becomes the right thing. If you give your son for the sin of a worthless people, he suddenly becomes the right thing, even though it doesn't make sense. The Bible says, hardly for a righteous man will someone die, but this king of the Jews has come to die for sinners. That doesn't make sense, but because it was God doing it, it became meaningful. It suddenly became like, oh yeah, that, yeah that's good. That's, yeah, that's what you do. You die for sinners, Absolutely. And Jesus said it. He says, the way that I am laying my life down, you lay your life down for your friends too. Because now God has done it. It has become the right thing to do. And so God does not repent of anything that he has done. But when he came down to experience the life of Adam and Eve, the Bible says God saw their pain. And he saw that the thoughts of their hearts are evil continually, which means their heart that is supposed to be a habitation for heaven has now become a domain of hell. The Bible says God repented that he made them. So God went through all of those just because of how much he loves you and he wants to understand exactly how best to guide you. You see, that was God's curiosity in action. He found you by his own inquisitiveness. He found you by his own curiosity. And the only way you are going to find him is to return the favor by being curious about his love, by being inquisitive about his heart. What is God thinking about me today? This time that I woke up is 30 minutes past my alarm. Why is this happening? What exactly does he want to bring out of it? And someone is like, man, will I even have any time to live my life if I keep asking all these questions? You will, because you will stop spending your time doing the wrong things, and this little time that you have left will be more than enough to enjoy all the right things. Because the moment you have, you just begin to receive. The moment you have that understanding, you just begin to receive. The moment you have that confidence in him, you just begin to receive. Let's leave the Exodus out for now and just break bread. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. God is good. Hallelujah. So, in fact, it's important. 
Exodus chapter 40 verse 5. <laughs> the Bible says, you, all, you shall, Exodus 45, you shall also set the altar of gold for the incense before the ark of testimony and put up the screen for the door of the tabernacle. I want this to form a picture in your mind. He foreknew you and predestined you all for glory. He didn't tell them to first of all put up the screen before setting up the gold. He set up the gold first and he says now you can screen it off. Because for the gold to be seen, you have to go through the veil. God wants everything that is precious to be sought out. Did you, did you see what he did here? He said, put the gold there first. And then after that, put the screen. Because this gold is not for every eye to see. This gold is not for the unsearching. It is not for those who are, who are not seeking. The gold is for the seekers, the ones who are ready to do whatever it takes to find that door and to open it. The ones who are ready to question and to be curious about the goodness of God. Don't forget the example that I gave you about the spouse. The Lord said to me that they need to behold what you are handing to them as the key that opens up their joy. You see, because the moment you start asking the right questions, you begin to receive the right insights, and then you recognize that it is actually all right with you, even though it seems like it is turbulent. How do I know that it was all right with the disciples? Jesus was on the same boat and he was asleep. If it was that bad, how can Jesus be asleep? He wasn't dead, he was only asleep. That's because rest is not supposed to be what is around you. Rest is supposed to be the stabilizer within you. The gold is here, but you need to search it out. And I pray for you today by the grace of God that you will understand the simplicity of what has been shared with you and begin to apply it before you complain about something that you do not understand. Seek understanding first. Things like, he has brought us out of Egypt Blessed be the name of the Lord. And so if he brought us out in his love and he has chosen to express his love by not letting us find water, what are we missing? We are the ones that haven't found all the clues. It's not he that hasn't given all the goods because he is good. You see, that mindset now allows you to stop your mouth from speaking guile because everyone does not mind if you ask questions as long as you believe. As long as you believe what his word says. As long as you believe that the person you're asking the question to is a good God. You're not questioning his goodness, but you are questioning your own lack of understanding. And that is what brings understanding. Because God has had enough of his children always complaining about what they don't understand when there is something called questioning. Questioning is what helps you to understand, not complaining. How many of us here today, while we were asking ourselves the question, how did we get here? How many people, and you don't have to raise your hand if it didn't happen to you, how many people felt gratitude and thanksgiving just somewhere in their belly when they asked that question? Everyone, many people, praise the Lord. But if you don't ask that question sometimes, instead of being thankful, you can find yourself complaining that, does this guy have to preach long every time? I'm just asking. I know you're asking, but that's not the right question. The question is, how much does God love me to bring me in contact with somebody who is so passionate about sharing the truth with me that he will not let me go easy? It changes everything. Let us receive the body of the Lord and drink of his blood and remembrance of him. Again, we're so thankful because there's nothing that we have to do to qualify for the body of Jesus. In fact, if anything at all, it is his body and his blood that qualify us for the mercy and the grace of God.
And so do not look down on yourself as being unworthy of his body. No, it is his body that makes us worthy. So let us all receive. The Bible says of his fullness have we all received, all. And when it says all, it is the same all that is in Romans chapter 3, wherein it was said that for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So every single one of us that have fallen short, we constitute part of the all that have now received of his fullness, grace for more grace. So with a heart of gratitude and no thought of condemnation, receive his body and drink of his blood. I have the life of God in me. I have the life of God in me. I have the spirit of the Son of God. I have the life of God in me. I am excited because, you know, when the Holy Spirit showed that to me, praise God. Amen. I wasn't going to do it. And he said to me, if you're not going to do it well, don't do it. And that is the reason why I tried to put a little bit of dance and excitement into it because it's like, what he showed to me was this. He said to me, many are looking around and they miss what's within. You see, as a priest in the Old Testament, if you stood outside the veil, you saw sinners, you saw goat, you saw blood, you saw mess. That was all you would see outside of the, outside of the, the screen. But Behind the screen was the gold. And so when you, when you stand and you look at all of what you have around you, sometimes you look at all the bills around you, sometimes you look at all the, all the failed projects around you, sometimes you look around, you see all the ungrateful people around you, you look around, you see things that are not pleasant, you see the, all the opposition that comes. You need to remind yourself that regardless of what's around you, you have the life of God in you. And that is worth more than gold. It is worth more than gold. Instead of looking at the storm, they should have just looked into the stern and they would see the Lord. If I were you today, I'm going to look inside because there is gold inside. And I'm going to be thankful. I'm going to allow my attitude to be that of a winner, that of a more than a conqueror. Because if I can get my attitude to be up there, I'm going to attain the altitude of my attitude. It is the way God has encoded life. Paul and Silas, they had the attitude of free men so they could not be bound because that would be injustice before the Lord. You know, they were in prison. And when you're in prison, incapacitated, you're supposed to be sad because you are deprived of your freedom, but they know that they have already been set free. And so the chains to them were an, were unreal and unfounded. They're like, what chains? We are free men. And what do free men do? It's they rejoice, they swing their arms. And that is the reason why the angel of the Lord had to come to fulfill the word of the Lord. And so I want to encourage you today, let the Lord help you renew your mind and attain the attitude of gratitude so that you can rise to where you need to be in Christ Jesus and stop being beneath all things. See, this word is brewing in my spirit. And I see the hand of the Lord opening the pages backwards and showing you that which you wrote over what he wrote. I can see what you wrote. You wrote it over what God wrote concerning you, and that anomaly has been responsible for the loss of joy, for the loss of peace, for the impatience, for the agitation. Even in some people, it has become sleepless nights, waking up and panicking, and that is because your subconscious mind cannot tell the handwriting of God different from yours, and so it's reading what you have written over what God has written. The mercy of God is at work in the house today and the Lord God Almighty has gone back to that page and the Lord has given you an opportunity to peel off that which you inscribed over what he wrote. Undo your own unbelief and lack of confidence in your God. 
undo that which you wrote concerning yourself. You wrote certain limitations for yourself. How do I know they're limitations? Because they're written in your own blood, not in his. And the Lord is saying, remove it and then see what I have written. Every limitation that is based on your own blood. Every time you have told yourself, oh, I wish I could do this, but I don't have what it takes. That is your handwriting, not God's. Begin to tell yourself now, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Begin to remind yourself that the one who foreknew you and predestined you, he did so because you responded when he found you to his love. The Bible says that all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose because though are they, these are the ones that he foreknew and predestined. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, it's not too late. doesn't matter how advanced you are in age. It's not too late. That limitation was an age-inspired limitation. So remove it. And just tell yourself, it's not too late. We can do it. We will do it. It will happen. We will enjoy it. We will prosper in it. Undo that limitation. And I also want to say to somebody here today, and I'm going to wrap up on this note. This might affect more than one person, but I want to say to one person in particular. The Bible says, Tia, that the hand, that the heart of kings is in the hand of the Lord. And like the course of a river, he, God, changes it where he wishes. The way you change the course of a river in the natural is by moving dirt, is by moving the earth, is by putting an obstruction in the path that the river has chosen to take so that it might find another course. So when the obstruction comes to their way, don't pray for it to be removed. Thank God for it because that's what would change their mind and cause them to repent. So when you see, it's happening in a few days from now, the Lord says, when you see that opposition come their way, when you see how life seems to resist their plans, you can sympathize with them just to fulfill some righteousness. I just say, oh, sorry to hear that. But in your heart, say, Father, we well, thank you because by this, this river will change its course. And I say that it affects more than one person. And just ask for the Lord to give you the heart of discernment that you may know the mountains that are before Zerubbabel, the ones that need to be cast away and be made plain, and the mountains that have been positioned so that others may attain repentance. So that you're no longer working against God in the lives of the ones that you have interceded for. I wasn't going to say this, but I'm going to say this now because um, many of us are very accountant-minded. We're always calculating things. And because we're so familiar with what figures mean in this economy and in our lives, we limit ourselves to figures. The Lord is saying, I have more for you. <laughs> Praise the Lord. The Lord is saying... I have more for you. You're good with numbers. You're an accountant in your mind. Yeah, everything has to balance. The Lord is saying, if I say it will be balanced, it will be balanced. Five loaves and two fish cannot feed 5,000 by bookkeeping. It doesn't matter how great an accountant you are, it doesn't make sense. And every now and again, God expects for us to trust him to make it make sense by multiplying what is in our hands. Retire from being a God to yourself and be a child of God once again and let him love you. God bless you, Communion House. I'll see you Tuesday. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's celebrate the Lord again. God is good. Thank you, sir. The giving details are on the screen. And while we're preparing our offering, let us give in faith. I remember um, a time early on where I forgot the key 
to the closet and it was a Tuesday. That means we need plenty of supplies to set up the food and whatnot. And uh, Pastor Rosemary came in and uh, she asked me, why haven't you prayed? And she prayed that the door be open. And I said, okay, Lord, let me pray. And I was frustrated. Oh, I was frustrated that day. I was hot. But the Lord led me to a place, to a cabinet where a key was. I said, let me see if this key works. And sure enough, it was a spare to that closet. I'm going somewhere with this. While we're preparing for our giving, today I was reaching out to Pastor Rosemary. I said, I don't know if we got enough communion. And uh, she said, um, or I said to her, remembering that moment of the door and the key coming, I said, but let me go ahead and pray before she tell me to. And so I gave God thanks. I gave God thanks for the communion. And I'm telling y'all, the message was going, pastor was ministering on faith, and I'm standing there in the back. I said, Man, I hope we got enough communion. But I said, let me silence myself. And as Brother Kenyatta was passing it out, I said, okay, we're getting low. Lord, I need you to do something. <laughs> Make sure we got enough. And I saw as he looked up at me, hey, we good to go. It was sweat off of my forehead. But then my dear little brother Gavin came in and said, hey, I ain't got communion. I said, holy ghost. I walked down to the front, and there was one left. <laughs> Look, I don't know about y'all, but I hope that inspires something in you tonight, in your giving, because we are the ones that overcomplicate things, you see? And pastor was just ministry. We want to be accountants in our own right, but the Lord has not called us to that. He's called us to believe on his name. God is good. So with the given details on the screen, dollar sign, communion house, cash app, at communion house, PayPal, as well as the Zelle giving information. There are many ways to give. If you need an envelope, our brother Kenyatta is there. Hallelujah. Father, we give you praise. For by your word, we have something. We have that faith, oh God, that you have equipped us with. And moment by moment, Lord, as you have called us even tonight to ask those questions to look at where you have brought us to not despise humble beginnings. Father, we thank you for in it we see from where we have come how good you have been to us. And even by the delivery of your word on tonight, how your goodness and your favor goes before us. Father, we thank you for a night of stirring up, knowing that we shall indeed exercise what you have given us, that measure of faith. For indeed, we know that you give seed to the sower, and you have allowed for us our footsteps to be ordered to this house where we know this is fertile ground. Now, Lord, work in our hearts. And we say by faith that we receive, that we know that instruction that you have given us in giving to this ministry, O oh God, this coming together of brothers and sisters, this man and woman of God, O oh God, that pour out each and every week doing the work of the ministry. Let these offerings be multiplied, O oh God, for you are the one that brings multiplication. You are the one that brings increase. And Lord, let this ministry, O oh God, bring glory to your name, bringing edification to the body. Lord, I thank you for every household represented here on tonight as we give in faith, as we give in obedience, O oh God, that you indeed will meet with them, that you will visit with them. All glory and honor belong to you, and we all said amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, let's celebrate the Lord. Yet you never know when we're getting out of here at a different time. This is a new day. Let's not get used to it. We give God praise. <laughs>
What's funny is my dad and I were talking about it earlier. We said, man, I wonder if pastor going to go short today. And sure enough, when he said that, to go round up the children, matter of fact, these over here were so excited. They said, oh, wait, what? He's wrapping up? So uh, we, <laughs> we thank God for his mercy. Fellas, don't forget, this upcoming Saturday, men's conference, if you don't have the details yet, get with me. Um, we're looking forward to really just uh, pressing into the invitation that has been granted unto us through that ministry. And we're looking forward to just uh, going to support and hear what the Lord is doing there and also to be a blessing. Amen. And so, uh, again, just get with me if you don't have those details. Let's make sure to lock that in next Saturday. There's a Friday meeting as well, but those details will be discussed in the men's chat. Amen. All righty. Everyone have a great night.